Okay, that's recording. Hi everyone, welcome to um, episode number four in the psychology interview series. Um, I'm Dr. Ian Tyndall at the Department of Psychology at the University of Chichester, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Associate Professor Kevin Mitchell from Trinity College Dublin. Kevin is uh, the Professor of uh, Genetics and uh, Neuroscience at Trinity, and he is he did his undergraduate degree at Trinity and his uh, PhD at the University of California and his postdoctoral studies in, in California and at uh, Stanford University. And Kevin has been back in, in Trinity since 2002. Um, Kevin is, is an author of the book um, Innate, um, How Had the Wiring of Our Brain Shapes Who We Are. And he's also the author of a very popular um, science communication blog, Wiring the Brain. And um, he's uh, numerous pu 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 publications across um, research on both human brains and, uh, um, and um, anim animal brains. And I think he's one of the most fascinating science com com communicators out there. So you're very welcome, Kevin. Well, thanks very much, Ian. That's a very kind introduction. Thanks. And uh, Kevin, could we just start off with just, um, uh, can you just give some simple definitions of what is a gen genotype and what's a phenotype? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so those, those words come up in, in genetics when we're trying to understand how someone's DNA uh, relates to their traits, basically. So the genotype refers to the, say, the sequence of the DNA. So you, if we sequence your genome and, and my genome, all the three, three billion bases of DNA that, that we have, there would be some differences between us. And yeah. those differences that, that characterize us, we would call our genotype. So your genotype or mine. Um, and then, of course, if you, if you compare the two of us, you know, physically and physical characteristics and so on, we'd also have uh, different traits. And those are what's called phenotype. That just comes from the Greek. Pheno just means to show. So it's, it's what you show. And um, I mean, one of the really interesting things, of course, is that we also have psychological phenotypes, right? So we have traits in the way that our minds work um, that are also characteristic of us, just as much as you know, facial features or how tall we are, whatever, blood pressure, physical things like that. So um, yeah, so a phenotype is, is anything that is, is shown basically. And um, I mean, operationally, you know, when it comes to behavior, there's lots of things that you could call a phenotype for experimental purposes. So you could uh, say, take someone's answers on a questionnaire about personality traits and a score that they get for say extroversion. And that would be your phenotype that you work with or you know, an IQ test or um, the answer to whether you've ever been arrested or whether you're on psychiatric medication or whether you have a diagnosis of autism or any of, the, any of those things, operationally speaking, can be a phenotype. And I mean, one of the interesting things one of the real sort of challenges of genetics is to understand how genotypes relate to phenotypes. That is, how do genetic differences between people in this case, but it could be between animals or even between species, um, how do the genetic differences relate to the differences in, the, in what we call traits? And actually, I mean, while I'm at it, that, that raises an interesting point because what genetics, that kind of genetics is trying to understand is not everything about how you come to be completely the way you are, yeah. but just where the differences arise between people. And that's, a, that's an important point, because once we start talking about things like the genetics of behavior, it can sound to people like what we're saying is, oh, your genes are controlling everything about your behavior right now which is not the case. And that's not, uh, you know, that's not what the experiments are designed to look at. They're designed to look at how genetic differences between people are associated with and presumably in some way cause differences in behavioral traits. And, and that, the, in that sentence, in some way cause is doing a lot of work because that's the real yeah. mystery is um, how do genetic differences you know, manifest in in really sort of complex aspects of human psychology. And so that's really fascinating. It's really well explained, Kevin. And um, I, I think one of the concepts that I find that when I'm trying to explain to students, and I, I see it when I'm a reviewer as well for peer-reviewed journals, um, that a lot of people seem to make the mistake about 
they they when they they make the statement like something like high Q is then um, high IQ is something like fifty percent in, in inheritable or that it's the heritability estimate is about fifty percent, and then they just assume that it's that fifty percent explains every single person. So would you be able to kind of explain that the her that the heritability is just means across populations rather than yeah. for the, an individual person? Yeah, yeah. So. Um... So the term heritability is really tricky. It has a very technical term in human genetics or genetics generally. Um, and the tricky thing about it is that it, it sounds like it should have a colloquial meaning uh, mm. of like heredity, and it's not quite the same thing at all. Um, so the heritability is about the variance in a trait. So if you take something, let's take height, for example. If you measure a load of people, you'll see a, a nice normal distribution of, of height, right? And so the width of that bell curve is the amount of variance in the, in the population. Yeah. And when we say something is, say height is like 80% heritable, what we mean is that 80% of that variation that we see is attributable to genetic differences between people. And you can think about that by saying, well, okay, if everyone was genetically identical, if everyone was a clone, then how much of that variation would go away, right? You'd have a much, yeah. you, you wouldn't be left with no variation, uh, but you'd have a much smaller amount, right? Yeah. And so um, when we figure out that, uh, that measure, and you can do that by looking at uh, different kinds of twins, by looking at family members, um, basically by trying to correlate um, how similar people's phenotypes are, their traits, yeah. relative to how similar they are genetically. So obviously, you know, you're you're 100 genetically similar to a, your monozygotic twin. You're 50 with a sibling or a parent or a child. You're 25 with you know first cousins or, or um, whatever. So um, so. So once you do that, if you look across these different sort of um, um, gradations of similarity and you measure the phenotypes, you can, you can use some mathematical tricks to figure out how much of the variance is due to those genetic differences. And um, what that doesn't mean is that, you know, 80% of your height as you, your height is due yeah. to genetics. Right? That, that's a nonsensical thing. It just doesn't apply to an individual at all. So within an individual, obviously, genes and environment, uh, you know, ha have to work together. There's an interplay between those th those those things that leads to um, that leads to development. But and, and so you can't you can't in an individual really disentangle them. But actually, statistically speaking, in terms of components of variance, you can disentangle them. That's a legitimate thing to do, although you have to make some statistical assumptions along the way, one of which is that your genotype is not in any way correlated with your environment, which is actually not always true yeah. as it happens, as it happens. But um, so generally speaking, that's what the heritability means. It's the proportion of the variance that we see that is due to genetic differences between people and not something else. Now, one extra caveat there is that just because there's a, you know, a genetic origin to the variants that we see in something doesn't necessarily mean there's a proximal biological mechanism for that. There can be lots yeah. of reasons why genetic differences could lead to a different outcome. I mean, for example, uh, racism <laughs> is based on, on genetic differences, yeah. right? It starts with genetic differences between people that they look different and then they're treated differently and then they may have very different outcomes. So the mechanism there is not, is not uh, genetic, but the yeah. origin of the difference is. I mean, that's a very stark example, but there's a lot of, there's, there's other examples like that um, as well, where you know, there, there, there could be mediating effects of the social environment that, that, that themselves are genetically um, different to begin with. Yeah, because you make the interesting point, like when you describe some twin studies as well in, in your book, that when you've got uh, identical twins and who are raised apart in different families, that like the, the different environments, completely different families, maybe different schools, different um, different religions, if religions involve different um, friends, different socioeconomic background. And yet that seems to only count for about maybe 10 to 15 percent, generally speaking, of, 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 the, of the variation in terms of the of the twins' major kind of psychological traits or behavioral yeah. 
traits. So that seems to suggest that it is very strongly heritable somehow, certainly for um, um, identical twins anyway. Yeah, um, well, I mean, yeah, one of the, it, it's been one of the really surprising findings in the field, um, you know, over the last 20 to 30 years, I guess, of, of people doing these kinds of studies, especially twin studies and adopted studies, where, first of all, if you look at adoptive siblings for most psychological traits, whatever, however you measure the phenotype, there's very little similarity between them. Yeah. So being raised in the house, same household certainly doesn't induce any sort of extra similarity in most personality traits, for example. Even things like body mass index, which you would imagine is a, a lot yeah. due to nurture, really isn't. It's due to a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a set point in your, your appetite and your energy balance, how your brain regulates your energy balance, depending on your uh, your adiposity, basically. So it's a, yeah. it's really a be physiological behavioral trait um, that adoptive siblings don't share at all, actually. They're just not correlated. Um, and then if you look at, at twins who are, you know, reared in the same family versus twins who are reared apart, they're not much less similar in these traits when they're reared apart. And so yeah. by you, you, when you're doing these twin studies, as I said, you can work out how much of the variance is due to genetic similarity. And you can similarly with some study designs work out how much of it is due to having a shared family environment. And really what that means is that across the whole population, how much does differences in family environment lead to differences in traits? Um, and usually, as you said, it's about, you know, the max is out at about 10% of the variance in, in most psychological traits. And actually the heritability of most psychological traits is about 50%. So, yeah. so that leaves this big 40% sort of unexplained by um, either your family environment or your genetics. So it doesn't seem to be either nature or nurture. Um, and that's partly what, um, you know, one of the things that I explore in innate is what could the sources of that variation mm. be there's a tendency to assume that if something's not genetic, it must be environmental, right? I mean, that's the way we, we, yeah. we balance up the scales, nature, nurture, genes, environment. Those things tend to be just um, put opposite each other as the only options. Yeah. But actually the genome doesn't encode the, the, the full outcome, you know, at birth even. It, it doesn't encode an outcome at all. It just encodes some biochemical rules. I mean, the, you know, you've got, sequence of DNA, it's just encoding some proteins. Uh, the proteins, they bind to each other or they stick to the pieces of DNA to regulate the amount of, of other proteins that you make. And the, some of the um, sequence of the DNA is important for determining which genes get turned on in which cells and how much. Right? And so some of the variation that we have between us will be, you know, you might make a little bit more of protein A than, than I did, for example. Yeah. Right? Um, but, even in identical twins, when you run those processes of development, um, the, the outcome varies. They're just noisy on a molecular level. Within a cell, the proteins get made, they, they diffuse off, they randomly bump in and off, you know, in and out of each other. Um, the genome is no longer controlling it at that point. And in fact, okay. there's not even enough information in the genome to specify the, you know, every connection in your brain. So instead, these processes just run. Um, and they will tend to run within a range, but they're not exactly, you know, the outcome won't be exactly the same if we go, if we ran it again. And so ordinarily yeah. we don't see that, but in identical twins, that's exactly what we see. And of course in animals, we see in clones of animals, we see that all the time. And, and what you see even in clones or twins is some residual variation. And you can see that in identical twins when you look at their faces. You can see it in clones of animals. You know, it's really, uh, really obvious. Um, but you can also see it in, in the structure of our brains. So if you look at this, you know, if you use neuroimaging to look at the structure of brains between twins, identical twins, they're really, really similar, but they're not identical. There's some areas in particular of the brain that, that are yeah. more, more variable. So there's a, there's, a, there's a third source of variation. It's not just genetics or environment there's developmental variation itself. And it, and it comes from within the organism, it's intrinsic. It's not, it's not just 
you know, some random events that we don't know about. It's really just that's the way the processes work. They're not specified to that fine degree. Um, and so one of the sort of interesting upshots of that is that when you look at, say, the heritability of IQ or psychological traits and you see it's like 50% or something like that, people assume that's sort of a, a hard limit on how innate they are. But actually, they can be much more innate than inherited. If you, you know, the, the genetics go some degree to making us all different from each other. But even in, in twins, there's this added variation so that even when they're born, before they have any sort of experience outside the womb, their brains are already uh, quite different from each other. And that's an important source of variation in, in everything, um, in our physical traits as well. And actually, you can see it. I mean, when I said we, do, we don't get to see two runs of the program, that's not quite yeah. true because we do have two runs of the program on, on the two sides of our faces and two sides of our bodies, which develop in embryogenesis past a certain point, almost independently of each other. And you, I mean, you can see how symmetric we are. Um, you know, it does a really good job. The genome does yeah. a really good job um, of, of producing the outcome within that this sort of narrow range, but we're not really symmetric. And actually, if you look at faces and you do, a, you know, you, you take a selfie like this and you split the left side and the right side and you make mirror images of them, um, then you can really see a big, a big difference between the left and right sides of faces. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's a really important um, third component of variance. It tends to get overlooked, but um, I mean, one of the one of the important implications of that is it places a hard limit on how much we could ever predict, how precisely we could ever predict someone's psychological traits from their genome, just from okay. their DNA sequence, because the heritability is just a certain amount, and then the the environmental variance doesn't seem to be much at all, actually. And then you have this other chunk that's random and that's just not systematic in any way. Yeah. You, you'll never be able to know anything about the out, you know, predict anything about the outcome. Yeah, um, I, I think that's what a lot of people find it hard to accept. It has, they need that answer. They need yeah. the percentages and, and there have to be either the hard line on the, on the nurture environment side or the hard line on, on the nature and, and, and the, the genetic side. Um, I think that's really interesting just you have to accept chance like i think that that's what i like in, in your writings is you're uh, that you're very open to that and, and you say that where i've seen other people say criticize some points and said no we just haven't found it yet mm. but as you said we might never find that yeah, yeah. so it is actually just chance and and and, and r r random um but what our arguments might be then so if, if, if people say something like autism will, can run in families or schizophrenia can run in in, in families and then we say, well, it's not chance; it's it's, it's actually passed through ge ge the yeah. genetics. But if you say as well that something like autism is a de novo mutation, as it, as it happens, so it's hard to predict whether you'll pass autism down in families or not. Then, yeah, well, so um, so autism is complicated in that it does tend to aggregate in families, um, and if you have a you know if you have a siblings say with autism, you know, then statistically your risk of autism is increased quite a bit. Um, however, it's also the case that most people with autism don't have an affected first degree relative. Yeah. And those two things can sound like they're contradictory, but actually they're, they're um, highlighting two different modes by which a condition like that can be genetic. So in, in one mode, you, you can inherit uh, some genetic variations or mutations from your parent or parents, it could be one or two or a bunch, um, that when they come together in, in you are enough to cause um, that condition. Right? But you can also have a case where there's a completely new mutation that wasn't carried by either your mother or father, it was generated, or it just arose sort of spontaneously um, as a copying error basically, in the generation of, of the sperm or egg that led to the creation of yeah. it. And that's, for example, how Down syndrome arises. It's not inherited from parents usually. It, it's an event that happens often in the egg in that case, where you get an extra, a, a, an extra chromosome just because it didn't separate properly. Yeah. So we call those de novo or, or just new mutations. And a lot of cases of intellectual disability are caused by those kinds of new mutations. And 
I mean, there's a simple reason for that because when a mutation like that is really severe and causes a condition like that, the people with it are less likely to have children. And so, it, it, you know, the more severe the condition is, the more likely it is to be caused by a new mutation than one that's inherited. Although, okay. like I said, you can have cases where, you know, there's, there's multiple mutations inherited, which independently weren't enough to cause a problem in, in either of your parents, say, but when they come together, then that can manifest as a problem. So, so you have these two um, different ways that you can genetically um, sort of, uh, that can genetically result in a high risk of autism. Now, what you're inheriting there is not autism. It's a risk for some kind of what we could term developmental brain dysfunction. And yeah. there's a few elements of that that are important. First of all, that can manifest in very different ways. And sometimes, uh, and we see this when we look at twins, for example, where, you know, for autism, the concordance rates, if one twin has a diagnosis of autism, the chance that the other one does, if they're identical twins, is about 80%. So very high. Um, and for fraternal twins, it's only, you know, 10 to 15%. So it's much, much lower. Yeah. That suggests a lot of cases are caused by new mutations, which are always going to be shared by identical twins. And they're never going to be shared by fraternal twins, which arise from separate sperm and separate eggs. Um, however, when we just look at the monozygotic twins and you say, okay, well, if one of them has it, the other one has about an 80% chance. Well, what's the 20% of the variance? You know, there's, it's not, yeah. you're inheriting a risk for the condition. You're not necessarily inheriting the condition itself. And if you look at things like schizophrenia, the risk, you know, for twins is about 50%. So there you've got an, an even bigger kind of unexplained element. And again, when you see that, you say, okay, well, the genetics explains some of the risk, but what explains the rest? What explains whether someone actually develops the condition if they have that high risk. And we could look at to the environment and say, well, maybe it's something like that. And uh, of course, you know, there were very popular theories that autism or schizophrenia were caused by the family environment, you know, usually refrigerator mothers or something like that. Yeah. Um, and as it turns out, when you look into twin and family studies and adoption studies, there's really no risk at all that's associated with the family environment. Um, and, in, and people have looked for other systematic factors outside the, the, the house, outside the home environment. Um, and really, there aren't many. I mean, there are triggers, right? You know, for, for things like a, a psychotic episode or, for, yeah. you know, a depressive ep episode or mania or something like that, or anxiety, there are triggers that can happen, experiential triggers. But there aren't really necessarily systematic environmental factors that influence whether you manifest the vulnerability to those triggers which would get okay so even, even with, so even, even with schizophrenia or psychosis so like like there's plenty of people who argue that you that you um people who have experienced severe trauma whether it's emotional abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse at some yeah. point in, in, their, in their life will more likely manifest it so is it that that um so even though there's, there's not the one major trigger in an event but if you've got experienced multiple experiences of that you're much yeah, more likely yeah. to well, so, so is that the case that anybody could develop psychosis or is it only those people that kind of had 50% yeah. inherited kind of risk in the first place? Well, that's a really good question. And so I'm glad you raised that because I, I should caveat what I'm saying when I say there's no effect of a shared family environment by saying that those studies don't necessarily sample kind of extreme environments or extreme experiences like the ones you just referred to. Yeah. So, uh, so I shouldn't give the impression that, you know, psychosis or some illness like that can't be you know the cause of really uh, caused by or certainly contributed to by really you know abuse or, or, or neglect and it, it certainly I think there's good evidence that it can be hmm. there is still even in those cases a question whether everyone who goes through those conditions I mean clearly not everyone who goes through those experiences develops those kinds of things and yeah. so there is a question okay well what was there something different in the vulnerability or the resilience of that person that allowed them to either, uh, you know, buffer the, those effects in their development um, or cause them to, to, you know, sort of succumb to them in, in, in terms of um, expression of an illness. Yeah. But actually as just a, on top of that, you know, if you think of some of these things like, like autism where the, uh, 
you know, there's, it's so early onset, there's less of a, a even a window for experiences to have an effect there. Yeah. Okay. So there, I think it's much more likely that it's, it's some aspect of this developmental variability that, that has an, has an, has an yeah. effect. And one of the ways to try and explain that is, um, is by thinking of the, the, the developing brain as following a kind of trajectory. You know, like there's this landscape uh, metaphor that I use in the book, which I think is great, of a ball sort of rolling down this, this, this landscape. And it's generally being kind of channeled in, in one direction. And we might think of that as the, the healthy, uh, healthy functioning, uh, you know, brain within the, within the sort of standard range. But there can also be a kind of a, an offshoot, right? You know, the, the brain, once it starts going down it, can be channeled into that state. And so in, in some way, uh, if you think about the brain as a developing dynamical system with all these, uh, you know, the, 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 the trajectories of development are very non-linear in a mathematical sense in that each step along the way relies on all the previous steps having happened properly. Yeah. So if I'm gonna connect up some neurons to form a circuit, well, their nerves have to have been guided together properly. And if there, and that won't happen if these cells never migrated properly, and the cells won't yeah. migrate properly if they never proliferated and differentiated properly, and so on. So, uh, and every time you, you know, you 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 mess with some element of those processes, that's the that's the the means by which the genome encodes how the brain gets structured. You also affect the second phases of brain development, which are activity dependent after all the neurons are put together and connected, you know, put in place and connected, they're talking to each other all the time. And, and that's sculpting and refining all of the circuitry. So if you put them together slightly wrong in the first way, then all of that refinement of the circuitry can go slightly wrong as well. And there may be sometimes these sort of threshold events during development, which just start to channel the trajectory down one route uh, towards, a, towards a, what we recognize uh, as a pathological state, as opposed to a healthy state. So, um, so yeah. that's the way I think of it really as, you know, in, inheriting a risk um, and then some, some elements of, of randomness during development can influence the trajectory. And that, I mean, the trajectory, like brain development doesn't stop at birth, it continues, brain maturation continues. Yeah. And, and it becomes then informed by experience along the way. I just want to say one other thing just before I forget is that um, we, you know, the genetics of autism is not separate from the genetics of schizophrenia or ADHD or epilepsy or intellectual disability. All of those things have overlapping genetic risk. Yeah. And that's why I use this, this sort of catch-all term earlier of developmental brain dysfunction, because that that can be what you sort of inherit and then how it manifests is, is much more much more idiosyncratic and you may go down one one route or another so if you have you know i mentioned earlier that if you have a a, a twin with schizophrenia your chance of schizophrenia is, is quite increased um but statistically speaking your chance of having an autism diagnosis is increased or an epilepsy diagnosis or an intellectual disability diagnosis so they're all um there's a kind of a shared risk across those conditions. And then um, in thinking about, well, why do we see these particular phenotypes emerge? Right? It's, really, it's really kind of weird to see something like um, psychosis or mania, um, or even the, even the cluster of, of what we would, you know, sort of behavioral and personality traits that we would recognize as autism. Like why does the why, why do we see those and not all the other ways that yeah. the, you could imagine the 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 brain or the mind might vary? Uh, so there's something about the the the, the sort of self organizing nature of brain development where you, you get these sort of alternate states. They they weren't what was designed in yeah uh, in, okay. in engineering terms, and I don't mean this in a in a judgmental way at all. It's just an engineering term. They, they'd be called a failure mode of a dynamical system. And they're sort of unpredictable in complex machines. You get these unpredictable outcomes, not designed, just a, just a kind of a consequence of all these feedback loops and, and things that are happening that when you start to tweak with some of them, it, it shunts it down an unexpected kind of um, trajectory. Yeah, so that's really just so. 
just in sense, if you map it out, say in the kind of typical autism tripart kind of model, model um, then you've got the repetitive kind of behaviors, the social communication difficulties, um, and, and so on. And there, so you said, it, like, it is interesting that it'll map out like that. Like, so, but do you think that autism is too broad a spec of what a spectrum now? Because, like, a lot of the difficulties you, you might see with, say, children with non verbal. Uh, autism might be very, very difficult, uh, or, sorry, very different to someone with high functioning autism. And like, so is, 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 do we know anything about why, why somebody would manifest, say, as a much lower functioning autism that needs a lot more care and assistance than, than someone who is high functioning and yeah, holds down a, jo mean, a job and is married and so on? In some cases, we, we know, and in some cases, we don't, I think. Um, I mean, first of all, yeah, autism is a really broad label. And as, as you and I'm sure your, your listeners will know, um, th those labels get sort of defined and redefined and refined all the time as we go from one you know, iteration of the, of the DSM or the ICD to the next. Um, and they're, um, they're constructs, right? You know, they're, they're, um, they, they arise because when you look at enough uh, cases of people, you can recognize a, a kind of cluster of, of, of symptoms or yeah. behavioral phenotypes that you would call a type. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we have um, terms like autism and schizophrenia and so on. But they're really open constructs with very fuzzy borders. Um, and, and that's why psychiatry is such an art as much as a, as a science, because you, yeah. you know, the, the, those diagnoses shift and many people move from one diagnosis to another over their lifetime and so on. So they're not, you know, there's a question as to how much they are natural kinds, things in the world that exist unto themselves, as opposed to just labels that we put on things. And um, my feeling is that the endpoints are in a sense how they do have some validity as types. Um, the genetics says that there's overlapping risk. And so that's yeah. where this, this trajectory comes into play because you can't just look at the genotype and explain the phenotype in yeah. a static relationship. You, you, have, you can't just go from here to here. You have to look at that trajectory. That's where the explanation lies for a particular individual. Um, and um, so, you know, you asked about why can we explain why one person might manifest with really severe autism and another person with much less severe. And the answer, I think, is in some cases, maybe yes, in that there were, you know, there may be some mutations that we could see that, that tend to be associated with much more severe manifestation. But generally speaking, um, you know, most of the genes that have now been identified. And I, I mean, I should have said earlier that, that, you know, we've shown that these conditions are really heritable, but, you know, the field has really moved on and identified hundreds of, of risk genes for these conditions where, you know, a single mutation in one gene can really increase risk very dramatically. And then on top of that, there's, 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 there's a sort of a background genetic effect as well of how, the, I like to think of it as how well your genetic system is able to buffer the effects of that big mutation. Okay. And not everybody thinks of it in that way, but anyway, even in monozygotic twins who, who share all of that genetic information, right? Any big hits plus all of this background of, of sort of small uh, variation, um, you could have one twin develop very serious, very severe condition, uh, very severe symptoms of autism and the other one not have it at all. Or have you know what we used to would have called been called Aspergers a few years yeah. ago, the very high functioning. Um, so again, we can't necessarily look to genetics to explain everything about that difference. There's some, there's just a lot of randomness at play in how yeah. these things play out. Frankly, that's very, that's really interesting. Um, Kevin, I think you've got really interesting approach to say personality. And you explain it well and well in, in the book as well. So and you, you and you mentioned in the book that is about somewhere between four thousand and eight thousand words in the typical dictionary yeah. to describe what we would refer to as a personality characteristics and traits. And we like so the, probably the most popular model. And you mentioned in the book is the five factor model that we can each be characterized according to our levels of extroversion, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and neurotism. But what I found particularly interesting was that you picked an example of impulsivity as 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 a as a factor. And that suppose determines whether we're more likely to become an alcoholic or a, a gambler or overeat 
and uh, and so on. But um, you, you were saying that that's actually a middle level factor. It's actually driven by um, decision making. I was wondering, could you explain that that uh, before? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. So, you know, when I started um, really, you know, working on that chapter um, about personality traits, you know, what it was already obviously well known and had been shown many times before that some, you know, when you measure these things like extroversion and so on, uh, that there's that they're fairly heritable, like about forty percent or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they show the same pattern that we talked about earlier, very little effect of the common shared environment and, and some other factor that I think is largely developmental variation. Um, but, you know, when I started thinking about those, it really started to question, well, what is that, right? What is extroversion? Is it, um, you know, the idea is that, that when you do all these different tests, right, you measure different sort of aspects of people's behavior and they show a correlation between them. Right. And they, they, and then you could say, well, there's a latent construct underneath that that's contributing yeah. to all of those different aspects of behavior. Like, you know, do you like to travel? Do you like to go to parties? Uh, do you enjoy sex? You know, all, all of those things can come into it, right? Yeah. Um, and the idea that there's a latent factor underneath there is statistically just true, right? I mean, that's just a statistical way to measure it. Uh, but what does it mean biologically? And I think a lot of the way it's generally been interpreted is that there's a biological factor in the brain, extroversion is there in the brain somewhere that's contributing to all those different things. Um, and the thing is when people have looked in the brain, you know, they've done imaging studies, they try to look yeah. for any, anything in the brain that correlates with that. The size of different bits of the brain, um, you know, dopamine levels, uh, functional connectivity between this bit and that bit, whatever, they don't find any. Yeah. I mean, there's loads of papers published that, that claim to find a, a correlation between a personality trait and some measure in the brain, but actually there's nothing solid there. They don't really replicate. So um, it started me thinking of whether, well, is that the right way to think about them that as those things being the things in the brain, as opposed to, uh, you know, flipping it rather than, rather than extroversion being the latent construct underneath these other things, I think, well, no, it's a, it's a descriptor on top of them that, that, that just statistically summarizes their relationship to each other. And, and once you start thinking, okay, well, what could it be in the brain? Um, well, at least once I started thinking about it, it gets into questions of decision-making really, because yeah. what, I mean, personality traits are just patterns of action selection or patterns of decision-making across contexts. And so if you think about what goes into the decision-making of an individual, um, then, then we can see circuits in the brain that control things like reward sensitivity or punishment sensitivity or threat sensitivity or how salient novel things are. Um, you know, what, what kind of threshold you, you need to have to be confident enough to make a decision. Um, how much you weight long-term goals versus short-term ones or how much you, you know, how much you do delay discounting, how much you downweight a reward depending on how long it's gonna take yeah. for you to get it. All of those things are, are both, of their, firstly, their traits, uh, but secondly, they're things that we can see even in animals, right? So, so it's a much more sort of biological basis of considering it's, it's really behavioral control, right? How's, how's behavior controlled? In any creature, you're going to need to, you know, assess a situation. You're gonna to need to um, consider your goals right now, integrate a lot of external stimuli, um, assess your internal state, like are you hungry or not hungry? Um, consider the opportunities, balance them against the threats and, and all of that. And, and so different people might do that differently. In fact, they, they have to, right? There, there has to be variation in these things, um, yeah. in, in these circuits. So, so the model that I put forward in the, in the book, which is you know, speculative, but feels, uh, it, it let me sleep at night anyway, um, <laughs> is that that variation in those low level traits that things like threat sensitivity or um, risk aversion or delay discounting would uh, inform or impinge on something like impulsivity, right? So say novelty salience is higher, well, your impulsivity might be higher. Uh, if your threat sensitivity is higher, your impulsivity might be lower, right? And then th those sort of factors, what I call the mid-level traits and impulsivity was just an example would then contribute to things like extroversion and neuroticism 
and conscientiousness and so on and, and openness to experience. So, um, you know, there's an impulsivity that drives extroversion. Um, there's also an impulsivity which is negatively correlated with conscientiousness um, because it tends to, you know, you tend to jump around uh, doing things and so on. So, so that was the scheme and it was an attempt to relate the psychological constructs that, that we use in humans to the biology of decision-making that we know a lot about in animals. You know, you can even go in there using techniques like optogenetics yeah. where you can, you can activate specific circuits with a flash of light in a wake, in a wake behaving animal. Um, and you can not just make it do something, right? You know, make it go to sleep or make it, make it start moving or make it attack or make it want to mate or something. You, you, you can remote control actions like that but you can also control its cognition. You can retune those, those different circuits on the fly in an awake animal and change its confidence level in a decision, for example. So there's wow. tremendous work there that I felt like the, the human psychology personality field wasn't connecting with. Um, and that was, that's, so that's what I was trying to, um, trying to do there. Yeah, because you see that people, it's like the intolerance to un un uncertainty comes up a lot in a lot of underlying personality factors, just how much you just, you just need to be in control and you just can't tolerate, like it's designed to dampen your anxiety levels about yeah, what's yeah. happening next. And we see that in lots of, lots of different conditions, not just autism or schizophrenia, but we see it in many different, and just the ordinary person who has no specific um, condition. So it is something like that, that it is the brain's decision. We make decisions at every single moment in, 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 in the day. Yeah. So a conscientious yeah. person likes to follow the rules an open person likes to experience um, new um, new things and agreeable person will choose not to have an argument even though that, um, they might be denied by what they actually want in that particular situation. So at every moment, as I say, in every junction, we're making a decision all, 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 all the time. Yeah. So I thought it was nice to bring it down and said these things that we can actually measure, we know how to measure yeah. these, whereas we can't, we, as I said, you, you can't see extroversion in the brain. You can't That's see right. openness in, in, yeah. in, in the brain. So, and along fact, with rather, a lot of rather than, as well. Yeah, rather than extroversion being one thing, you know, you could, the, the point of this is that there's so many of these underlying combinations that can be tuned up or down a different profile um, that two people could end up similarly extroverted, right? Scoring yeah. the same, I think, but for very different underlying reasons and, and with quite a different, still quite a different nuanced sort of profile of behavior. Um, you know, once you once you scratch a bit beneath the that that fairly crude yeah. high level construct, um, and I mean, so so one of the interesting things about the biology there is that a lot of those circuits are um, mediated. Uh, a lot of those uh, parameters of decision making are mediated in the brain by neuromodulator circuits, things like okay. dopamine and serotonin yeah. and acetylcholine and so on. Um, but you know, we're learning much much more about. Uh, different subsets of like dopaminergic neurons or serotonergic neurons that project to different parts of the brain and carry really different information that, like I said, in animals, you can tweak uh, and really figure out, well, this is carrying this confidence threshold information, or this, this is the, actually a threat sensitivity circuit. Um, and so in terms of the genetics, then that what, what's interesting there, and it's a it's a kind of an important and somewhat depressing lesson from the genetics. Once you start to look at the genetics, you say, okay, well, we have this trait, something like extroversion. We can try to find, or neuroticism actually is a good example. You can try to find um, mutations that affect that. And, you know, we know, for example, that, that from pharmacology and from some of these um, experiments in animals that serotonergic circuits uh, affect what we, what, we would expect would manifest as neuroticism in humans, anxiety and, and uh, negative emotionality and, and other things like that. Um, and so what you would expect is that if you had mutations in genes in the serotonergic pathway, say that make serotonin or that break it down or encode the serotonin transport or things like that, that you might affect those behaviors. And actually when you look in animals, if you mutate those genes, you, you do get effects on those kinds of behaviors mm -hmm. and you get uh, actually, even in some of those cases, you get impulsivity and aggression um, from those. So, but when you look at the spectrum of variation in humans, the naturally occurring variation, you see something quite different in that for any, for any trait that we look at, 
there may be a few of the genes that you find where there's naturally occurring variation that are that encode proteins that are really closely related to the to the function that you're interested in. Yeah. But there will also be variation in thousands of other genes that only indirectly is affecting that because the brain is this whole big holistic system, right? Because all of these genes are involved in building it in building all of the cellular connections in any part of the brain. Mutations in any one little bit of any gene anywhere are gonna have some knock on effects on your phenotype of interest. Okay. Now, any one of them is gonna have a tiny effect, but because there's thousands more genes that are not directly involved in the function that you're interested in than the ones that are, they, they actually overwhelm that signal genetically speaking. So when you look at the genetic variation affecting even those traits uh, where even that we think we know something about in a biochemical or pharmacological kind of level, they don't zero in on that biology. It's, it's sort of all over the place, which is really depressing as a geneticist because the point of doing this genetics, trying to find what are the variants that affect these traits is the hope that it reveals something about the biology. Yeah. And of course, you know, that, that paradigm has been hugely successful in other areas of, of, of science and biology. Um, but it's, it's most successful where the phenotype that you're looking at is actually very proximally related to some molecular function. So cancer, for example, when you look at mutations in cancer, you find things that affect cellular proliferation and cellular differentiation and yeah. DNA repair and mutation and stuff like that. So they're exactly the processes that go wrong in, in cancer. But when you look at you know, personality traits or psychological traits, or you look at risk of schizophrenia or autism, the, the genetics that we've done, it doesn't zero in on very particular biochemical pathways. And I think that's telling us something really important. It's frustrating, but there's something really important, which is that uh, there aren't really proximal molecular pathways for those high level cognitive functions. That's just not, the brain just doesn't work that way. Um, it doesn't have specified genes for specified uh, you know, cognitive functions. Sorry, that was my son coming yeah. in and out. Um, so th those, are, those are emergent functions of, of neural circuits. So the genes that we find are genes for building a brain and variation in how your brain gets built manifests in these many different ways, but not, you can't look at the genes and go, oh, I, see, I understand why that led to this. It's, it's, it's quite emergent, um, which is important to understand, I think, because sometimes people want to jump from, you know, a gene for schizophrenia yeah. to say, oh, well, now I have a drug target. Or, uh, you know, the, and, and that's too, you, you can't make that leap. It's the, the distance yeah. between, the distance between genotype and phenotype for cancer is like this, right? They're very proximal. For psychology, it's like this. And you have to figure out all the steps in between. And that's development, actually, yeah. to get from genotype to phenotype okay. is development. Were, were there any candidate genes that you kind of, that you almost fell for or got too excited by in the past and it's kind of taught you a lesson that just don't go there or get too excited, even though it looks promising. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a salutary tale in the field in general about um, candidate genes. So when people started doing genotyping of um, people with these conditions, they, looked, they zeroed in on a few genes that they thought might be involved. And so for schizophrenia, they looked at you know, genes in dopaminergic pathways because uh, the, the antipsychotics work through the dopamine receptor. So that, yeah. you know, made some sense as a hypothesis. And there's a bunch of genes that people, that people looked at there. Same for the serotonin transporter gene. There's some famous examples there. Um, unfortunately, they weren't very well done statistically, sort of methodologically. So they tend to have small samples um, to look at lots of variants and lots of phenotypes sometimes, and then not correct that for all these multiple tests that you've done. So if you look at, if you just do exploratory stuff in, in sort of high dimensional space with lots of variants and lots of phenotypes, well, something's gonna show up as significant at the 0.05 level. But even if you just do 20 tests, then you know, your chance of having one in 20 by chance is obviously pretty good. 
So you have to, you know, you have to correct your stats. And, and really the field learned that, that there's a huge literature generated of associations between the you know, variants in some of these candidate genes and personality traits or the, the dimensionality got even greater when they started looking at neuroimaging traits because then yeah. you can look at the whole brain, anything in the whole brain, up or down, big or smaller, doesn't matter, and try to connect it. And then you have this vast uh, array of tests being done. And that literature just, did, you know, nothing replicated really. Um, the huge problem with publication bias as well in that whenever people got a positive association, they tend to publish it. The negative ones went in the file drawer. So people realized eventually that that wasn't working. And they, um, I mean, the field to its credit really changed drastically how they operated. And instead of every individual researcher having their own little sample of a few hundred carefully painstakingly collected patients or something um, they realized you had to pool them and get to samples of not hundreds but tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. to uh, and actually that also you had to look well it became possible to but it's important to look across the whole genome at the same time and publish all the results of all the variants across the genome so you just scan everywhere, the whole genome, any variant that, that's there, you know, sometimes people might have in the DNA sequence, it might be an A, in another person mm. it might be a T, and you just look for a frequency difference between those. Is the, is the A slightly more common in people with schizophrenia than without? And okay. that's then a, a, a risk factor. And you do that across the whole genome at you know, a half a million sites or something like that. Um, and because you do so many tests, you have to have a huge, really, really stringent statistical threshold. Mm -hmm. And then to reach that, you have to have huge, huge samples. But that's what people did. And they, they formed these consortia, um, really changed the way that they work and, and did start to find um, these genetic variants that, that come out that are, so there's, there's sort of two kinds. There's one that are common in the population. And um, sorry, let me just turn my email off so it stops bonging. <laughs> um, ones that are um, common in the population that tend to have really tiny effects. So they might increase risk by a factor of less than 1.1. Okay. Right. So that's, that's minuscule yeah. by itself. But there are probably thousands of them in, in the genome and we all carry some, some burden of them and we differ in, in, we differ in that burden. Um, they're common because they don't have much of an effect, right? If a new mutation arises that, that, that increases your risk of a condition like that, it tends to get selected against very quickly. And what I mean by that is that the people who carry it tend not to have as many children. And yeah. so it doesn't spread within the population. So if you have variants that are common across the whole population, that means somebody way back here was the person where that mutation happened. And then it spread through all these generations. So you have this big background of these common variants that, that sort of, um, I mean, I referred earlier to this sort of background, what's called polygenic risk for these conditions. And you can see that people vary in their risk statistically. What I think that's doing is giving a background that reflects how robust your genome is or the developmental program is to insult like uh, a, a rare mutation. So these yeah. rare mutations are also found and, and um, to me, it makes sense to, to think of those two, two things as interacting, not as separate types you know, of schizophrenia. They're, they're, yeah. they're combined genetically um, to inform risk. It's really interesting. So, and do you, do you think that when you're saying, will, will, um, will someone say, of, some say some of the incredible traits of, say, some types of autism and the higher functioning level with like the incredible memories? I'm not talking about like this, the, the savant. I'm just talking about the general high functioning. They, they typically have some incredible abilities whether it's systemizing and recognizing patterns and and fantastic memories which seem to be the kind of ideal traits for many jobs going forward because a lot of the a lot of the certainly for men anyway a lot of the physical labor jobs are going to go over the next 50 50, 50, 50 years so most of it is going to be cognitive bay based jobs when you're recognizing patterns and so so do you think that it's something that will become more common because it's being selected in that it's actually useful even uh, though i said it's got some okay. well, two yeah there's two communication yeah. yeah, there's two parts to that. One um, is is it more useful? And you could certainly make the argument that you that you just did, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, argue against that because I think you know it, it's it's there's 
certainly some truth to that in that some areas, um, those kind of traits will be um, advantageous on the job, as it were. Natural selection doesn't care about that. Yeah, yeah. Natural selection just cares how many children and grandchildren you have. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's selection does change because of human activity. Um, I mean, for example, you look at a trait like asthma, you know, a hundred years ago, people with severe asthma would have, would have died, you know, really early and they don't anymore. Um, and that, that is a case where we've, we've almost removed the negative selection on that, yeah. on that trait, which actually could, could cause an increase in the trait in the population because the, the lid's not being kept on it basically anymore. Um, but I don't, um, I don't know that there's any analogous situation for psychological traits um, really. And of course, you know, once you start talking about that in those terms, yeah. it, it brings to mind, of course, the, the, um, the specter of eugenics and, yeah. the, and the horrific history of, of eugenics and the, um, you know, the fact that, that many people with uh, intellectual disability or, um, you know, psychological, psychiatric conditions, even um, things like epilepsy, were deemed unfit uh, to, um, well, uh, un unfit to breed uh, in many places uh, in, the, in the UK and in the US. There were forced sterilization programs. They, they lasted until the 1970s in some places. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's got its worse um, outing in, in Nazi Germany where those people were deemed unfit to exist. So, um, you know, I think one of the one of the things that we're sort of learning when we when we look at the genetics of these conditions is uh, is just the, the range of, of um, variation that we see in human faculties, and some of it gets pathologized and labeled, yeah. uh, and some of it is just uh, is just sort of variation, um, and you know there's there's much more of that variation that I think exists than, um, than we previously recognized or realized. Um, and I certainly hope that, um, that, that we society in general, general is realizing that we need to, you know, make room for, for everybody um, yeah. to, to, to allow more diverse ways of, of thinking, to recognize that different people think in different ways. They see the world in different ways. Um, and you know the way that we have society aligned doesn't suit everybody always. So um, you know I think there's really sort of positive aspects there um, of understanding um, that neurodiversity is a real thing. Yeah. Let me just add one caveat to that, though. I'm I'm not in the camp that would say uh, that there's no such thing as a, as autism as a disorder, because clearly many people, you know, as we've discussed are really severely affected and suffer from the condition. And so, you know, that's the definition of a, of a disorder. So I, I think it's important to recognize there's, there's a range of, of, you know, experience. And then there's some conditions where, you know, people really do suffer from them, not just because society doesn't fit or they don't fit in society yeah. very well, but just because they're, they're um, really severely affected. So I think those two things are can be tr both be true at the same time. Yeah, so interesting. Um, you make a good, a good point in the, in the book as well about um, people can get surprised when they're thinking about how the human brain functions and they think that it's modular and there's different sections of the brain, ones for decision making, ones for reading, ones for um, uh, ones for, for, for listening, ones for uh, recognizing emotions and so on. And uh, it's much more integrated than that. There's like the, um, and also uh, you make a really nice point, I think that and um, people who have kind of regarded as high IQ when, when, when you scan their brains with fMRI scans and PET scans and so on, you, you actually see much less uh, activity in, in their brains. So it seems as if the brains are more efficient or the connection between them work more fluently. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting when the modularity thing is, is really important. So, you know, it is an old idea and a lot of, well, a lot of neuroscience has been engaged in mapping different functions to different parts of the brain. And it's certainly yeah. true, you know, that you've got visual parts of the brain and you've got motor parts and you've got more thinky, thinky parts yeah. up here and so on. Um, but they're all interconnected in circuits and no one of them does anything by itself. Um, and so, yeah, people have tried 
too much to associate uh, functions to really little blobs of the brain. And, and not just to think, well, this is where the function happens, but to think, uh, you know, if it's bigger, then that must mean you're better at that function, right? I mean, that's basically yeah. phrenology, you know, in, yeah. in the days when all you could do was feel bumps on your skull, you know, the idea was that the bump on the skull reflected how big the bit was mm -hmm. underneath that's here that, that yeah. mediated, you know, acquisitiveness or, you know, weird sorts of traits, right? Um, so it can be the case that certain functions are involve particular parts of the brain without it being true that the size of that bit of the brain determines the, the, yeah. the level of that function. And that just turns out just not to be the case. Um, although again, there are thousands and thousands of papers out there claiming to have found that kind of an association. They just don't ever replicate basically. I mean, yeah. there's maybe a couple examples like the size of, of real estate in your primary visual cortex that determines something about uh, the, the spatial resolution of your, of your visual field. And you can, you can see that with like susceptibility to some spatial illusions and stuff like that. But that's, a, mm -hmm. that's almost the exception that, that proves the rule. So, um, so when it comes to, you know, like we said earlier, trying to find bits of the brain that correlate with extroversion or neuroticism or things like that, you just don't find any bit of the brain where the size of it correlates with that. With intelligence, it's really interesting that, you know, people have looked and um, for bits of the brain that are associated with greater intelligence. And apart from overall brain size, which is correlated with in intelligence, um, you know, with a, cor a decent correlation, like 0.25 to 0.35, somewhere in there. Um, but apart from that, there isn't really one bit of the brain that's more associated. It may be slightly more frontoparietal, but not much. There's no, you can't point to one bit in there. And um, I mean, the example that you were referring to there earlier, I think is really about the, the efficiency of brain networks. And so when you look for uh, parameters that you can derive from brain imaging that are correlated in any way with intelligence, they're almost always some global parameter. You know, it's not, it's, not how, it's not how this circuit works, you know, this one right here. Yeah. It's basically sort of the, the network efficiency of the whole network of connections of the brain. That's what's associated with intelligence or the, the, yeah, the overall size or the you know, cortical thickness all over the place. So um, intelligence seems to me to be very much a global trait. And in fact, I sort of, don't think it's a thing in the brain either. I think it's an indicator. Yeah. It's an indicator of, of broadly and vaguely speaking, how well the brain is put together. And I think the genetics of intelligence fits with that too, because the genes that people are finding associated with intelligence, you know, they're not neurotransmitter genes. They're not, they're not uh, something about, you know, the metabolism of your neurons or how fast they fire or, or you know, some the efficiency of synapses or something. They're, they're neurodevelopmental genes. They're genes for building the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what happens there is really interesting because it, it gets back to this idea that you can have each individual mutation that you have is going to have some specific effect on some very particular thing. But collectively, they can have more general effects because of the, the sort of interlocking network of feedback loops between all of the genes that control all these developmental processes. They're, all those loops are designed to really robustly channel the development down into this well-functioning range. But the more of them you start to kind of degrade a little bit, not only do they have their own individual effects, they collectively make the whole thing a little bit less robust. Okay. And, and they make that channeling just not as good as it would be otherwise. And, and so it's kind of spreads out the, the range of phenotypes at yeah. the end. Um, and that, that can manifest in, in, in lots of different ways. One of the ways it can manifest is that the whole thing just globally doesn't work as well. Yeah. And I, so you know, that may be what, what we see you know, what we measure sort of globally as, as IQ. Yeah, that's something, it's, it's interesting you mentioned eugenics and then with the, with the British Psychological Society yesterday is that they, they've decided to re-retire the Charles Spearman medal 
I saw that award for, for outstanding contributions because of associations with eugenics and Francis Galton and so on. We see that in, in institutions all across the UK, re renaming halls and lecture theatres and so on. And um, um, so, but with some of the research that we that we we've done, and I know you were in an Irish Times piece um, about two years ago. Um, there was a professor from UCD and also with Brian Roach from uh, NUI Maynooth and his SMART program, which is uh, strengthening mental abilities with relational training. So we've, we, we've done some research in that and published over the last few years. And we had a paper published in Intelligence just a couple of months ago. And I found actually found them very open to our ideas that that we could, it's not, we're saying that we're increasing IQ per se, but we're saying that we're, we can improve the abilities that seem to be measured by these um, in, in, in intelligence tests. And so for those people who think the IQ is a fixed construct, we, we said we can, we can certainly improve those scores, even if an IQ test isn't really measuring G per se, the original general intelligence factor. But I, I certainly found that community a lot more open because um, we were told that they were, um, they were hardline genetics, the DNA and your intelligence is fixed from birth pretty much. Um, but we found them quite open to our, our ideas that it can possibly be, be, be changed. And maybe some of the effects are smaller than, than what, what we think, but we're, we're working on various different um, versions of, of, of those studies now. But um, I certainly think that we, it, it is promising, it shows the effect of the, of the environment that even though you are inheriting certain yeah, genetics, yeah. still have positive influences. I suppose Absolutely. it kind of matches on with Richard and Nisbet, Nis, Nisbet's work and or his ideas and the, like, you know, like the effects of parents reading to their children every night and and they might have two or three thousand more words in their vocabulary by a certain age than those parents who don't read to the children uh, at night. And because it, it kind of goes against some of what Robert Plum and, and his colleagues would say that parents matter, but they don't really. But I, 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 I'm not, I think you put it really nicely in the book as well. Parents hugely matter, but it's probably more in the love and the nurturing and care and yeah. not necessarily than what well, they give like in their in their home environment, I say. It's interesting. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that um, there are a few things to say there. One is that when we measure things like psychological traits or IQ or so on, um, I mean, those, those have been designed or, or uh, they've been settled upon because they're stable traits. Right? Yeah. And that's why we use them. Um, and so it, it's not that surprising that they're not really um, dramatically affected by lots of uh, you know, experiential things. But those traits are just the, they're just the baseline of our behavior. You know, and our behavior is, is starts from there, um, but we have all these adaptations to our, our environment and our experiences, and we learn how to behave in, in those ways. Of course, those behaviors are informed by uh, those baseline psychological predispositions, but very much, again, this, you know, as a trajectory over time, not in some static, immediate kind of a way, um, you know, our behavior is so many aspects of our behavior learned and, and habitual um, and so those habits emerge in in an interplay between nature and nurture and i think yeah. um, there's often an idea that those two are set uh, antagonistic to each other but really you know there's all these ways in which our uh, our innate predispositions uh, affect our experiences and affect in, even affect our environment because we choose our environment as we go through our lives so, and in ways that tend to then feed back onto yeah. um, our initial traits. So for example, if you have a child who, um, you know, has dyslexia and is, doesn't like reading and isn't good at it, you know, doesn't find it, doesn't come naturally, um, then they're probably not gonna do it much. They're not gonna practice it. They're not gonna get rewarded at school. Instead, they're gonna get punished uh, at school with, with negative reinforcement. Um, they're gonna get discouraged. They're gonna fall behind their peers get more discouraged, want to do it even less. Um, and so you get a, you know, a vicious cycle there where you know, an initial difference that might not have been that great gets amplified through this cycle of, of, of experience. Uh, and I think the same thing can happen in a positive way with say intelligence where you, know, you have an intelligent child um, and, and you know, often that means that they have intelligent parents. Their yeah. parents uh, you know, may, may um, supply an environment that reinforces their own uh, or lets them reach their genetic potential yeah. intellectually speaking um, again they do well at school they find that rewarding they study hard and, and they they you know they get more um, they get more out of education and so on so that that I think is absolutely 
the way that these, these, these things happen. And in fact, when it comes to intelligence, one of the things that's been founded lately in some really elegant experiments is that when you do the genetics of intelligence and you see there's a genetic sig signal in some person that's associated with a, you know, intelligence um, based on these scores across the whole population, um, you, can, you can tease apart the elements of, um, of their genetics that's really, do, that's really acting in them as opposed to the elements that are actually acting in their parents. So I have some genetic markers that my parents carry, like half of the genetic markers that I have, my parents carry. Yeah. So my phenotype may actually be caused by my parents' genotype, not my own, or, or it could yeah. be both. In fact, it's both. Uh, but you can see in like adoption studies and, and these studies where they even look at the, they look at the genetics of the parents and the children and they look at the genetics, uh, they look at the genetic variants in the parents that are not transmitted to the children. So they can't be having an effect on the children's IQ, yet they're correlated with the children's IQ. Yeah. Which, which means that the parental genotype is contributing to the environment in which the children grow up. And that's part of the genetic effect on intelligence. Okay. So, so I think it's a great example. And, and those things have come out in the last few years. And actually, I mean, Robert Plowman's group is some of the ones who've done that work. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great example of that interplay uh, between nature and nurture, between your innate predispositions, um, your experience and your environment and the the sort of active loops that, that occur there in your own life and, and transgenerationally uh, as well. And of course, you know, you could, uh, that's without even mentioning the socioeconomic factors yeah. that feed into whether you get a good education or not. And, that, and that's another amplifying loop, um, you know, at the cultural level as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thanks. Is, is that what's meant by epigenetics, or is epigenetics a completely different idea than a phenotype, phenotype almost passing down? Yeah. Generation? So epigenetics is a term that means so many different things now that it's 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 almost it's a sort of actively misleading term. Yeah. Um, it's it's become very popular in in sort of uh, the, the the public mind, I think as the idea that maybe it's a mechanism where you can change, you can turn your genes up or down. And that suggests that you can turn your traits up or down. Now, really it's, it's, a, it's a molecular mechanism in cells, especially during development that lets them, once they get a signal from a, another part of the embryo say, that tells them, well, you should be a nerve cell. They, they turn into a nerve cell by turning on some genes the proteins that they need to be a nerve cell and turning off other ones like muscle genes or skin genes. And a long, long time after the signal that was in the embryo is gone, those cells have to remember, I need to keep this profile of gene expression. And they do that using this molecular mechanism, which is known broadly as epigenetics. Yeah. Um, so there's an idea that there's a cellular memory in response to an environmental signal but it's, you know, within an embryo, say. Yeah. Um, but people have taken that to be the idea, you know, to map uh, environment onto environment outside a person and cellular memory onto psychological memory, which is not yeah. the same. They're not the same things at all. They're just not commensurate levels um, of analysis. And so there is, you know, some ideas, well, there's a whole field of claims that, um, that, that things that happen, for example, to your parents or your grandparents, experiences that they went to can affect you through some kind of epigenetic marks that get put onto their DNA and so on. And yeah. that field, I mean, I don't want to digress, but it's, it's not solid. Let me put it yeah, like that. Yeah. It was really <laughs> just, you know, some of the um, research practices that I sort of referred to earlier in the candidate gene mm -hmm. studies are being repeated in this literature of you know just poor statistical methodology, tiny yeah. samples, publication bias, all these things. Um, so I, I actually don't think there's any good evidence for that at all. Um, so you know when people ask you know but what about epigenetics? It's sort of because they've sort of heard it. It's just this buzzword. Mm -hmm. I mean you have people like you know 
like Deepak Chopra, for example, who, who have glom, glommed yeah. onto it as a kind of a mechanism whereby, um, you know, you can, you can change the way that you are by you know, meditation or yeah. mindfulness or things like that, which is, you know, if that's true, I have no problem with it. And there can be psychological and neural mechanisms that explain that. You don't need to go down to turning genes on or off that, in your yeah. brain. You, do, you just don't need to invoke that. And there's no evidence for it. Um, so it's a, it's a way to kind of make it sound more tr- more sciencey and increase yeah. the truthiness um, of it because it sounds technical and, and, and impressive, but there isn't um, there isn't often a, a lot behind yeah. the use of the term. That's very interesting. So that'd be kind of an argument against genetic learning in during life. It, like, just uh, some people moving down that that line. Say that. Well, mm-hmm. look. Uh, obviously we learn things, right? I mean, we don't need to do genetic learning. We have brains for learning. Brains are super good at learning is really what they're for. Um, And we know, you know, a lot about what the neural mechanisms are for that. And, um, you know, there's reasons why they're not at the molecular genetic level for the most part in, in a whole neuron, for example, because, you know, when you're learning something, you want some of the connections between one neuron and another to be strengthened, like these ones, but not these other ones over here that connect to other neurons. If I just changed the gene expression in this neuron, all of its connections would be changed. Yeah. You know, you, would, you wouldn't have the specificity in the neural network that, that would be important. It would be yeah. like in a, you know, an artificial neural network, you want one node to change, and instead you, you change all the nodes connected to this one neuron that's not good that you, you know you've just lost or washed out all the information that you wanted to yeah. learn in the first instance so um yeah brains are good for learning we don't need okay. we don't need the genetics to do the to do the learning yeah uh, i'll just finish with one, with one more question so um you've got an, an exciting new new book coming out called agents agents yeah excellent so um could you give us a teaser of what to expect Sure. Yeah. Delighted to. Um, so really it kind of comes from, uh, it comes from being asked when I talk about innate predispositions and stuff like that, people think, okay, well, well, what does that mean for free will? I mean, I, you know, maybe I'm here making a decision, but if my decision is influenced by all these personality traits and my genes and the way my brain happened to be wired during, during development, well, I didn't choose any of that. So I'm not really in control of everything about my about my um, my decisions, and so once you start thinking about that, you, that's that's only the first level of the problem, actually, because there's a lower level, yeah. which is well, actually, really, it's just your the the brain is just a machine. You can take a very mechanistic view of the brain, and we're learning more and more. As I talked about earlier, you know, these experiments in animals where you can tweak its cognition literally on the fly. You can change what it's thinking by activating one circuit or another. And it's, it's easy to look at that and say, well, it, it's just circuits, right? You know, it's just a circuit thing. There's, it doesn't matter what it means. Uh, it doesn't matter mentally what it feels like. Um, you know, the contents of your thoughts don't have any causal power in the machine. It's just an electrochemical machine working away that's yeah. going to determine what you do next. Um, and actually even below that, you could take the physicist view and say, Pff, circuits you guys are that's just an illusion yeah. it's just atoms bouncing around right it's just a physical structure the atoms are all determined you know what they're going to do by the laws of physics so how could it be you know that the circuits even are actually doing anything it's just the laws of physics playing out you have an in- initial state the, plus the laws of physics tells you what the next state is so yeah. so there's some really hard arguments to figure out well how could we have free will how could it be that you and I can decide to do things. I mean, that's our everyday experience. Yeah. And of course, some people like um, you know, Sam Harris, for example, would say, well, you don't, it's an illusion. You can't get past this deterministic view. Um, and I don't, um, I don't accept that. I think that's a really limited way of, of looking at it. And I'm not willing to give up on our ability to choose so easily. Um, but, but I think to understand it, we can't we can't understand it by looking at humans. It, and you know, the philosophers have been doing it for 2000 years yeah. without coming to any consensus. Um, partly because it's the most elaborate, sophisticated version that we know of, right? Um, so my feeling is if you wanna understand something like that, you should back way, 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 way off and actually go back to the origin of life and say, well, what is it that distinguishes a living thing from a non-living thing? 
And one of the major things is that living things can do things. They are causal agents. Things don't, things don't just happen to them or in them. They do things in the world. So in some way, the, the evolution of life allowed uh, a kind of aggregation of causal power into a living thing um, that, that lets it, that lets it uh, control not just itself, but its environment. Um, and what I want to do is try to naturalize those concepts and to um, especially naturalize concepts like meaning and purpose and value. Because once you, once you talk about what living things are doing, the first thing they're doing is persisting. That defines living things, actually. They persist against the thermodynamic odds. Um, and they do that because they act and they sort of reconfigure their, their metabolism or they reconfigure their behavior um, in order to serve the purpose of continuing to persist. And because they have that purpose, and that's a real thing, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, not, there's nothing nebulous about it. It's a real yeah. operationalized thing. Then things have meaning relative to that purpose. Things are good or bad relative to that. There are some things you should approach. There's some things you should avoid. And so you start to get the origins of, of meaning. Um, and, then, and then you evolve, you know, in more and more sophisticated ways. And that's the, that's the arc that I want to follow in that book um, to say, okay, well, let's start with the simplest things. Let's ground some of these concepts. Um, and then and then build them up and see what we need to figure out how we escaped from all this determinism yeah. uh, from being just bags of bags of atoms controlled by the laws of physics because to me it's clear that we're not um, but it's not clear how we got that way and that's yeah. what I'm trying to um, explicate by by following that trajectory. Excellent. Um, do we have a, a release kind of date in mind, approximately? Well, there's a due date. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a due date is 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 December, and um, so hopefully, um, you know, sometime in the, the the summer, probably next year, if I can, uh, if I can find the time to actually write it. You know. Yeah, <laughs> looking forward to it. And um, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, you're an, an amazing guest. Um, that was a that was an entire. Um, modules worth for an entire semester's uh, worth of information there. Really thoroughly enjoyed it. But you explain you explain complicated things really well, really simply. And um, I just I I, I I learned a lot. And obviously I, I read an awful lot of your work. But even the way just the way you, you put it there, I think um, an awful lot of people could learn from you in the way that you put that across. Well, and your willingness to engage in you know, such a broad r r r range of topics there like so it is fascinating work, work that, that you're doing. And I think the books that you're doing and the blogs that you write are a great way of reaching ordinary people and explaining really complicated things in a way that the ordinary person can really un un understand. Great. Well, well, thanks very much, Ian, and thanks for the um, thanks for the invitation and, and a very enjoyable conversation. I, I hope your um, hope your listeners enjoy it. Thanks very much, Kevin. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye. Hear that.